Hey everybody, welcome to another video lecture, this time on carbohydrates. Let's jump right in. So we're going to talk about structures and look at some of the, um, the terms for the stereochemistry. Obviously, uh, we're referring to the fact that we could have carbons that are each um, have four different groups on them. So chiral carbons. And whenever that happens, we end up with left-handed and right-handed versions, um, or L and D versions. Uh, respectively. Uh, we're going to look at some reactions of monosaccharides to yield some important disaccharides and ultimately to yield um, some polymers of um, carbohydrates of individual sugar mo molecules. We're going to look at some of those biologically important uh, polysaccharides, um, oligosaccharides, which are just long chain or bigger chain than uh, monosaccharides. Um, we're going to look at some of the functions of those polysaccharides, and then we'll uh, relate uh, glycoproteins to um, carbohydrates and to the earlier stuff that we looked at, like membrane-bound uh, proteins and whatnot. So our monosaccharides can be, um, if we use some real organic chemistry terms, polyhydroxyaldehydes um, or polyhydroxyketones. Uh, we're going to end up calling those ketones that are sugars, ketoses, and the aldehyde sugars, aldoses. And I think that term will show up in here somewhere. Um, polyhydroxy, meaning they have multiple hydroxy groups, OH groups. Excuse me. Compounds that contain a single carbonyl group and more than two hydroxyl groups um, cannot be hydrolyzed into simpler carbohydrates and have the general formula of CnH2On um, are going to be monosaccharides. So key features, they can't be hydrolyzed into smaller carbohydrates, um, and they have single carbonyl groups. Oligosaccharides are monosaccharides linked together by glycosidic bonds. We'll take a look at those in a few minutes. And polysaccharides are what we get when we form these really long polymers. So carbohydrates are important for a few reasons, right? We use them as our main source of energy. So we break down carbohydrates, and we're looking at carbohydrates now because we're going to study um, some of those breakdown processes and those reactions that ultimately yield that energy. Oligosaccharides, um, these are important for uh, interactions between cells, communication between cells, recognition. We're going to see that our immune... Um, our immune system is keyed in, our antibodies are keyed in to lock into a lot of these carbohydrates on the surfaces of cells and um, uh, that are bound to, to proteins. And polysaccharides we're going to see are, are different ways that organisms essentially store um, carbohydrates. We store it in our bodies um, in one form, plants store it in a different form or in a couple different forms, and we're going to take a look at that. Um, in addition to saying that it's stored, um, plants also incorporate, um, not just plants, the bacteria so, to some degree, um, incorporate uh, carbohydrate um, and polysaccharides into their cell walls for um, uh, rigidity, for um, strength, for um, uh, protection, and so on. So our monosaccharides I mentioned are going to be aldoses or ketoses, and we're going to see some structures here in a second. Um, aldose meaning it has an aldehyde group, ketose, ketone group. A triose um, is a different way of describing sugars. This referencing how many um, carbon atoms there are. And so three carbon atoms will be a triose. Four carbon atoms would be a tetrose. Five would be a pentose. And so on. So we know that um, in our bodies, uh, for our DNA is part of the the nucleotides, right, we have a pentose sugar, meaning it's got five carbons in it. Okay. Uh, glyceraldehyde dihydroxyacetone. These are two examples of trioses. We'll see um, glyceraldehyde in the reactions, uh, metabolism of carbohydrate reactions. Some trioses here. Um, these are those, those ones we just talked about. Um, so dihydroxyacetone, no chiral carbon. It doesn't have any um, stereoisomers. We're going to look at 
the carbons that do here in a second. Glyceraldehyde, simplest carbohydrate that does have a chiral carbon. And so here's where we can start to um, see what happens to the number of stereoisomers that we get as each new carbon that is that could be uh, chiral is introduced into the molecule. So with glyceraldehyde, we actually have one chiral carbon, so we get two forms. We get D-glyceraldehyde and L-glyceraldehyde. Now the way that we differentiate these um, in, in organic chemistry is that we would you know, put the hydrogen towards the back and we would um, assign each group a priority and then whether that priority um, is in order, you know, one, two, three, clockwise or counterclockwise, we would assign it. We're not gonna do that here. We're gonna just take advantage of these Fisher projections um, that are ways of showing the sugars. Now with the Fisher projections, I think the up and down lines are bonds coming at us. The side to side lines are bonds going back or going away from us. This is how all sugars are represented, um, at least in their open chain forms. And what we do is we look at the oxidized um, carbon. We always put that one at the top. So you can see in both cases here in this Fisher projection, the, um, the carbonyl carbon, the most oxidized one, is at the top. Then we find the chiral carbon. In this case, for D and for L, it's the second carbon. And again, for those of you that are a little foggy on how we remember chiral and non-chiral, um, the reason that this carbon right here is not chiral is because two of its bonds are to hydrogens. So it doesn't have four unique groups if two of its groups are both hydrogens. Um, but the carbon up there definitely does. This carbon right here has an OH group, a CH2OH, a hydrogen, and then this um, carbonyl with a hydrogen on it. So four unique groups. Get rid of all that. Okay. Um, I forgot what I was saying. Oh, so what we do is we look at the, the last chiral carbon furthest away, I mean, from the oxidized carbon, most oxidized carbon, and we look at where the OH is. And if the OH is on the right, it's D. If the OH is on the left, then it's L. That's how we tell. So, um... That was a trio, so let's look at what happens as you start to get uh, some more. So um, some terms here, stereoisomers, of course, is what we're talking about. Um, enantiomers are those stereoisomers that are mirror images of each other, but are not superimposable. And of course, they're not superimposable because they're two unique structures. If they were superimposable, that means they're the same molecule. So these are different in their handedness, left-handed or right-handed. Um, Enantiomers are mirror images. Diastereomers, which I think the term shows up a little later in the reading or a little later in these slides, um, are the non-mirror image, non-superimposable uh, stereoisomers. And we're going to get a lot of those as well. So um, this is explaining our Fisher projections. We can go back and pause that. Uh, maybe that was too fast. Okay, You can pause it here if you want to read that. Okay, Fisher projections continued. Let's look. Um, so here we've got D-glucose. Um, so we've got six carbon sugars. So these are hexoses. So glucose and fructose both here are hexoses because there's six carbons. Um, an aldose, of course, because the aldehyde group, ketone, um, fructose, sorry, is a ketose because it's got the ketone group. Um, most oxidized carbon is written at the top, so most oxidized in both cases. Uh, sorry, that was the wrong one for this guy. Here's the most oxidized, still towards the top in the Fisher projection. And we look at the last chiral carbon, so for glucose, that's this guy on carbon number 5. And for fructose, it's also carbon number 5. And if it's on the right, then it's D. So note, now they're going to take glucose and show us both forms of that. The other version of glucose is the one where the last carbon, that's chiral, has it, the OH group on the left. We were doing this with amino acids. Uh, no, we weren't doing this with amino acids. We were doing this with... Never mind. It was another class. We were looking at amino sugars, and uh, we looked at where the amino group was, and that's whether it was left or right told us L or D. Um, wrong class. Okay. Um, let's 
see. So here we have a few different, um, we've actually got several chiral carbons, right? We've got one, two, three, four, four chiral carbons. So this is going to give a number of stereoisomers, and only two are shown here. Every stereoisomer is going to get its own unique name also. So glucose is what it's called when we have this particular arrangement of hydroxyl groups. Um, let's see. Uh, one more term here before I think a picture is going to show up. Um, epimers. Epimers are what we call um, diastereomers that are only different from each other in one chiral carbon. Because, of course, you could be different in all chiral carbons, or just two out of your four, or just three out of your four, or just one out of your four. So epimers are just different in one position. Here we go. I don't think that, yeah, there we go. This is the one I want. So we could look at this too. Again, this is kind of step by step. So this was uh, four carbons. Um, again, four carbons here. So this is just showing the two. Now, the reason we kind of show the D stereoisomers is because our bodies and plants and most uh, organisms tend to use or make the D version and not the L version. So in nature, we see D. <clears throat> Um, but you can see the difference between the D and the L here. They're mirror images of each other. And then these guys are mirror images of each other. Um, they're only different from each other. If we go back up here, they're only different in, in each other um, in one of those chiral carbons. So chiral carbon number three, they have the same position of the OH. Chiral carbon number two is where they're flipped. This guy's on the right, this guy's on the left. So these are epimers. Okay. And now let's take a look at this picture. So this is just showing the progression of how many different stereoisomers you get by introducing an additional chiral carbon. So here, one chiral carbon. Um, here, two chiral carbons. Here, three chiral carbons, four chiral carbons. So glucose is a member of the four chiral carbons family, six carbon sugar family. And you can see all of these are stereoisomers of glucose. Allose, altrose, mannose, gulose, idose, galactose, talose. Galactose is another important one. This one is only different um, from glucose at the number four carbon. So right here. That's where they're different from each other. Glucose and galactose uh, pair up to make um, a pretty important disaccharide called lactose. Okay, some reactions of monosaccharides. Cyclization happens, and this is because um, we've got, if we go back in here, just to take a real quick look, um, we can lo look at glucose, or actually let's look at talose, because talose doesn't have, um, I'm going to mess with this though. I'm going to put the, uh, the O... H in there like that. So this is the aldehyde part, right, of the um, the sugar. Now, if you remember, there are some reactions of aldehydes and ketones um, with alcohols. And these are called, well, when this happens, uh, an aldehyde and an alcohol, it's called a, a hemiacetal. So uh, a hemiacetal will form, um, can, can happen here, can form. And that's going to close this open chain into a ring structure. And so we have some ring structure, sh structure sugars. Um, <clears throat> so carbon number one and five are going to form this acetal, hemiacetal. And when that happens with our ketones, so this happens also with fructose, which we didn't show. Fructose has, uh, if you remember, we have fructose in here. I'm going to jump back just to show you. So fructose is this guy right here. Fructose, um, the reaction happens between this this carbon, this carbon's hydroxyl and this carbon, so we don't get a uh, six-membered sugar; we get a five-membered sugar. So that that's the difference there. But it's called a hemiketal when it happens with the ketone, and a hemiacetal when it happens with the aldehyde. Um, here are those reactions. So um, this is glucose. Glucose, when it forms uh, its ring structure, we call this general structure a pyran. Um, you're going to see the, the fructose structure we call a different, uh, it's going to give a different name. 
Um, what happens when this thing opens and closes, and by the way, it, it opens and closes, um, it's, it's a little more stable um, in one of these two forms, and I'll tell you which in a second. Um, but, but this reaction is still happening inside a, an aqueous solution, and if there's water around, this thing un, undoes all the time. So it opens and then it closes. It opens and then it closes. Um, every time it closes, the position of these groups, or, or I guess I should say, when this reaction happens, the position of this hydroxyl group varies. Sometimes it might be down, sometimes it might be up. I mean, when I say down, below the plane of this ring here and above the plane of the ring here, right? We're, we're looking at something called a Hayworth structure. If you're coming from OCHEM, uh, you're probably used to chair configurations, right? This is the, the better way of kind of showing the rings where groups are kind of axial or, or equatorial. Where they've got it, kind of doing that. And there are certain positions that are that are more stable. Like if you have a big bulky group, you'd rather have it kind of pointing out than up, and, and so on and so forth. Well, Hayworth projections uh, or Hayworth structures are often used to show sugars because it's a little just nicer to draw, a little easier to draw. Um, and we just show things as being above or below the plane uh, of, the, of the ring. If the OH is below the ring, we call it alpha. If it's above the ring, we call it beta. And so there's some terminology here. So this, this particular ring structure is alpha D glucose um, or alpha D glucopyranose. Um, and again, gluco coming from the fact that it was glucose, pyran because it's forming the pyran ring, os is how we name the sugars. Um, another way of showing that, that, that bond is keeping it in the Fisher projection. So you can see it here. Um, the one is now connected to the five via that, um, that hemiacetal bond, that new um, ether connection. Um, and again, we can get beta D glucose or glucopyranose uh, to use the more technical term. Let's see. And so this is just showing you um, that it can open and close and kind of form randomly the alpha or the beta. Now, it just so happens the beta form is a little more stable. And I think... If we look at, if we were looking at the chair conformation on that, oh man, I don't really want to draw that, but it has to do with, with the chair conformation. Um, and when it's alpha or beta, it's going to be equatorial or axial. That's what we're talking about. And one of these, because of the positions of the other OH groups or the other, um, uh, the other, yeah, so we can kind of see it here. So because these OHs are on the same side as each other versus here being on opposite sides of each other, this form is more stable. And so we, in, in solution, we would find more of beta glucose than alpha glucose. And that's just a, a fact that I'm sharing with you guys. We're actually going to see that we prefer to use or to hydrolyze bonds that are alpha um, or we have enzymes that are built for alphas, but it just it's interesting that the beta is the more um, more prevalent form. Okay, so pyranoses are the ones we just looked at. Now furanoses we didn't look at. Um, I think there's a picture of one. Let's see if there's a picture of one. Here we go. Um, so this is what fructose does. So general form of the one we just looked at, glucose over here, six-membered ring, uh, general form of fructose over here, uh, the, the main sugar that we'll look at, that's a, um, uh, a ketose. So again, furan is the name and pyran is where these come from. So pyranose and furanose because they look like pyran and furan. Okay. It's a lot of terminology. So this is a comparison of the Fisher Hayworth and abbreviated Hayworth. I like this abbreviated Hayworth. Drawing all those H's in there gets to be a, a pain sometimes. Um, and then a good illustration of the two types of sugars. So we've got a pyranose and a furanose. And again, this would be um, 
up, so beta. It's a little backwards than you would want it to be. Uh, we want to read up, down, you know, from top to bottom, and so alpha, beta seems natural, but it's backwards here. So you could just memorize it that way. So uh, this is an alpha, this is a beta, this is a beta. Now, um, there are some reactions um, of simple sugars. This, in addition to linking together to form polymers or disaccharides, um, some sugars can be um, reduced or they can be oxidized. And so whether or not um, you're reducing sugar, remember a reducing agent um, gets oxidized and that an oxidizing agent gets reduced. So if you're a reducing sugar, right, reducing sugar, then you get oxidized. And the only oxidize, uh, oxidizable sugars um, are aldoses. Aldoses um, are, are aldehydes, of course. They have that aldehyde group on the number one carbon. That can be oxidized into a carboxylic acid. Now, there are some ketoses that technically count as reducing sugars because they get isomerized into aldoses. So... I don't know if we could say that fructose, um, if technically we should say fructose is a reducing sugar because fructose gets isomerized into glucose and then, you know, it's a reducing sugar. Well, that just means fructose is a reducing sugar, not, I mean, gluco glucose is a reducing sugar, not fructose, you know, unless we're being like, well, no, the fructose molecule is now the glucose molecule, but it was a fructose, like all the little atoms here you know, and they technically are reducing or, or getting oxidized. Well, you know, are we counting atoms like that? So glucose and aldose is a reducing sugar because it can be oxidized into a carboxylic acid. Fructose in its form like that, fructose form, cannot. And so, again, ketoses in the presence of certain enzymes that can isomerize them, sure, we can include them as reducing sugars. Um, so again, oxidation of the aldehyde group gives a uh, carboxylic acid. Um, there's also some reduction that can happen. Uh, let me see if that's a slide I've got in here. Um, this is what we're going to talk about these. Hold on. Okay, th this is what I want. So um, they can be reduced. Sugars can be reduced meaning that the aldehyde group or the ketone group can be reduced back into an alcohol, either a primary alcohol if you're the aldehyde, uh, the aldose, or um, the secondary alcohol if you're the ketone, uh, the ketose. Um, these are called sugar al alcohols, sugar alcohols, um, or aldetols. And so aldetols are these sugar forms, uh, sugar alcohol um, variations of those carbohydrates. Um, I think this one right here is glucose. These probably are all, no, no, they're not. Uh, this is six carbons. Yeah, I think this is glucose. When glucose gets reduced, uh, we call it sorbitol. Some of these actually are sweeter tasting than the regular carbohydrate. So you find these in a lot of like sugar-free gum and stuff like that um, because they are sweet, um, but they are not the carbohydrates, technically. Okay, um, so so that's that's the reduction side. Uh, they do get oxidized, and so again, we we call the ones that get oxidized reducing sugars. Now there are a lot of um, tests out there that are useful or or that take advantage of the fact that um, ketoses can't oxidize and aldoses can, and so we can um, we can detect like sugars, certain sugars. Um, for example, they use something called the Benedict solution which will react with aldehydes, you know, aldoses, to produce a certain color change with a copper ion. And they can use that in like urine to see if there's sugar, which is a sign of, you know, kidney, kidney problems and that kind of thing. Um, they can detect, you know, the sugar, which, which shouldn't be in there. Um, there's a Tolins test, which can be used to actually um, to determine whether or not the sugars that you have are ketoses or aldoses, because only the um, only the certain um, aldoses will react and get oxidized. Um, let's see. Um, here's, here's another thing. This can actually tell you if you have monosaccharides or polysaccharides. And what I mean is, if you have a sugar group, 
I think I need a. There we go. If you have a sugar, it's a really, really sloppy sugar, um, and it has this, this, um, you know, this is the anomeric carbon. This thing pops open right into the long chain sugar, and then back again all the time. Well, when it pops open, it's a, it's susceptible to these tests to getting oxidized into a carboxylic acid and showing a positive test on the Benedict's or um, this this Tolan's test is it actually um, a test that in the presence of these um, silver compound and these aldehyde um, sugars um, will deposit a mirror like shine on the inside of a test tube and it'll, it'll basically make a mirror the silver will will get reduced um, and turn into silver solid, right? Which will coat like the, the, the test tube and make like a mirror. Um, so that's the positive result when you see the mirror. You're like, oh, this was a, a, a reducing sugar. Um, but anyways, um, when these sugars react together to form uh, polysaccharides, and in some cases disaccharides, um, those ends are tied up, you know? They, they, they're once, this is a really sloppy sugar. I apologize for that. Da, 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 it goes on. Um, since this is all tied up, these rings don't pop open and close. And since they don't pop up and close, they don't have aldehyde groups or ketone groups available. And so they would get neg negative tests. So there's a re there's tests that you can do to see if there's, you know, hydrolysis of sugars happening or if there's monosaccharides versus polysaccharides. Um, again, we could take advantage of this. Deoxy sugars, let's talk about what those are, since we know um, that uh, the difference between uh, DNA and RNA is there's a sugar, a sugar that's missing a particular oxygen. Um, so these are where hydroxyl groups get replaced with um, hydrogen groups. So here's ribose with uh, hydroxyls on our carbons, and then deoxyribose, no hydroxyl on the number two. So we, just a, a term that we know already, deoxy sugars. Aldetols, sugar esters. So um, these are important during uh, uh, metabolism. Part of the way that we help to, to break down our sugars is we phosphorylate them. And so phosphorylation involves adding a, uh, a, a phosphate group. Um, and so um, this phosphate, when it adds, forms what we're talking about here as the phosphate ester. And so the ester, because uh, remember an ester bond is like when you have a C double bond O, like if this was a carbon right here c double bond o o and then other you know r group but because it's a phosphorus it's a phosphate ester um we also see this as part of our sugar backbone for um not with this particular sugar right with the uh the ribose instead of glucose but we see that in dna's backbone phosphodiester bonds uh because there's you know two ester bonds all right, glycosidic bonds. These are the ones that are important for us right now. We're going to talk about how they link up to form disaccharides and how they link up to form polysaccharides. So this is the uh, the second half of our hemiacetal uh, or our, our hemiketal. We're going to form um, acetals um, by reacting that, that group with another alcohol. And so in this case, you can see what happens when we have this hemiacetal in an alcohol group. We're basically going to... Um, create a bond between this carbon and this O and everything that's attached to it. And then we're going to lose a water. Um, and so we form this ether attachment here. Now, what's going to essentially happen is that we're not going to add alcohols to our sugars. But if you notice, you kind of pretend that this is sugar number one and this is sugar number two. Sugar number two has alcohol groups on it that we can imagine reacting with, you know, our uh, anomeric carbon over here on our sugar. So when this happens, when we form this reaction, um, we call it a glycosidic bond. And a glycoside is this reaction, this sugars linking up through this linkage. Um, <clears throat> now, furanocides are the ones um, that are going to have the five-membered rings pyranocides are going to have these six-membered rings. So this is a pyranocide. C 
So again, these are the linkages that we're going to see um, that make up our disaccharides and our polysaccharides. The anomeric carbon can add to any of the OH groups in the second sugar. And we're going to have to specify alpha or beta in our linkages there. And the linkages matter. We're going to see that in our bodies anyways, we have enzymes for particular linkages, but not for others. Um, and we're going to have to number the carbons that are linked together. So we'll look at an example. So here is two examples. So this is an alpha 1,4 glycosidic bond. So it's alpha because this is our first carbon here, our number one carbon. Well, this is why it's 1,4, because it's from carbon number one to carbon number four. It's alpha because this carbon had its OH group originally down. Remember, down to up is how we're going to read these, alpha on the bottom. Um, and that's also known, we can see that just by looking at this bond. It's pointed down. So that's how we know this is alpha 1,4. Alpha 1,6. Carbon number one, carbon number six, it's alpha because it was pointed down. This is a weird way to show alpha 1, 6. There's another way that we do alpha 1, 6. Um, we just draw the carbon like above it. Right? That, that alpha 1, 6 looks a little better. It's alpha because this OH was down. It's 1 to 6. Um, beta, let me show you a beta. I don't know if I have a beta. I do have a beta. Of course, there's a typo here. Yeah, it's a big O typo. So this is perfect because I get to show you why this looks wrong. So does this look up or down? That looks down, right? That definitely looks down. They got it right on this side. This is up. This is up. Both of those are up which is why it's beta, beta. Um, the reason we, why we have to say beta, beta, not just beta, is because um, if we go back and look at the others, um, this here we can't control in this disaccharide. Um, plus also, it, this sugar is, is specific. This, was, this is down already, but that has, that's not the one that we say alpha, beta on. The only things we say alpha, beta on are one, one, number one carbon. So if this was a one, one bond, then we would have to say alpha because um, this guy was down and then alpha because this guy was down. Um, and again, this, this is random right here. This could be up, but again, it doesn't matter because it's not involved in this linkage. Over here in this example that they chose to, to give us, um, they're using the number one carbon to connect to the other number one carbon. And since both number one carbons are up, it's beta, beta, one, one. Now over here, I guess this is their, I guess they're trying to show, I guess what I didn't realize here is that one of these carbons is flipped upside down, right? This carbon right here, I mean, this sugar is just the other sugar flipped around, but still they've got it wrong in, in my point of view, because they didn't change this one. This is exactly the same. And this one they have up and this one they have down. So in my opinion, they messed up here. So let's fix it. So. To make this look like a beta beta, this should be up. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you see representations like this. Like this kind of bond right here. To show, you know, like sometimes you can't just flip a molecule around to make it look pretty. So this would show that it's a, a, a beta and that this carbon had an OH that was down. That's what, what this right here would signify. So I want to fix this to make it look like a beta beta. The way they've drawn it would be up for that one. And since this one's flipped around, but they didn't fix it, uh, actually, did they? Let's see. This guy is this one over here. And it was up, so that was right. So now it would be down, wouldn't it? It would be pointed down. So this one's perfect, just like that. So yeah, we would we would basically be doing a, a this kind of thing to it. 
I'm sorry. So let me show you what, what a few others would look like. A little bit nicer. So let's do... Uh, Let's do, let's do a, a beta. So this is an O here. So imagine that this OH was up and that this was also beta. It was up. This guy over here could be alpha. It doesn't matter because it's not going to be the bond. So if these two bonds right here are up, then we would show that as a, I'm going to do it in blue so that it stands out. It would just be like this. Now let's say that we had a different scenario. Let's say that we had these two sugars here. I always forget that guy. Let's say that this one was, uh, oh man. Sugar alcohol. I lost it. Let's say these two guys here, um, that this guy was OH down, and this guy was beta also OH up, then we would show that linkage like that. Or what, what some people do is they just move the sugar up a little bit. They move the sugar up so that they can just connect it like that because this one's up, this is one's down, or right in the middle. All right, you're not gonna draw these, so it doesn't really matter. Why am I focusing so much on it? Okay, that's what you do. You look at the position, um, and then you, you say alpha, beta. You only say it for the number one carbons. Uh, sometimes we see these weird stacking. Um, sucrose, table sugar is actually like that. We've got this guy, and then we've got glucose. So we've got fructose and glucose, and they're connected via an alpha, beta, one, two glycosidic bond. Maybe I have these guys flipped. Because if it's one, two, yeah, well, it's something like that. I might have them. I might have the sugars up. Uh, on, I might have this guy on top. It's supposed to be on bottom. Um, alpha, beta, one, two. Uh, you know, and they kind of show them stacked like that. Um, this would be one of those sugars that would give a negative Tollens test because both of the anomeric carbons are tied up in this ring and tied up in this glycoside, uh, or as a glycoside. Um, so they wouldn't be able to uh, to open up and they wouldn't be able to react. Okay. Variations in glycosidic linkages, meaning different connections um, are going to lead to different structures, um, whether they're going to be storage or uh, structural. So let's take a look at those. Um, if internal monosaccharide residues are incorporated, um, then only two glycosidic bonds, uh, from only two glycosidic bonds, then the polymer will be linear. So meaning that uh, monomers connected together like this would each only have two bonds, one to each side. Some of them, though, lead to three bonds, and that's where we get chains. So like this monosaccharide right here has three bonds, one to keep the chain going you know, on either side, one to other si either side, so that's two, and then one for the branch. And these lead to... Um, some branch structures. Now for our linear structures, they're connected via 1,4 alpha linkages. So alpha, because it's down 1,4. So alpha 1,4 all the way. Now we tend to, um, so I didn't go over any disaccharides, just, out of, just for your guys' knowledge. Um, we can link glucoses together and we get maltose we can link a glucose and a galactose to get lactose, and then glucose and fructose uh, give us sucrose, which is table sugar. These are some important disaccharides. Now, polysaccharides, long chains, 
are usually um, mono, uh, home, uh, what's the word I want to use? Um, they only have one type of monosaccharide in them. They don't um, have multiple monosaccharides. They're not like proteins where you could stick in lots of different sugars and get like fancy, you know, activity. Um, sometimes they do have repeating, alternating, um, but we'll see that that's more in like bacterial cell walls. Um, so what we see here in these um, long chain polysaccharides is one type of linkage, alpha-1,4, alpha-1,4, alpha-1,4. Now, just uh, in case I forget to say a little later, I think there's a slide on it. Cellulose, which is found in plants, dietary fiber, right? Um, this is actually linked together by the exact same sugar, glucose, D-glucose, but it's beta. It's linked together with a beta-1,4 linkage. So all of these were up. Uh, and that one little difference in all of these bonds means we can't, uh, we can't eat it. it. doesn't, we can't break it down. Um, okay, so what happens in um, plants, they have something called starch uh, that they store their sugars as. Now starch is actually a combination of amylose and something called amylopectin. Now amylose is an unbranched polymer. Amylopectin is a branched polymer, and it gets branched every so often. Um, I think your book is specific about how many um, monosaccharide units go by before branches, but uh, it gets branched with an alpha-1,6 glycosidic bond. And so we can see that here. It's happening between the number one here. It's alpha because it's down, and this is the number six carbon. So alpha-1,6, alpha-1,6. Now in um, our bodies, uh, so this is what plants store um, as starch, amylose and amylopectin. In our bodies, we have something similar to amylopectin called glycogen, which just has way more branches on it. Um, okay, let's see. So this guy is again, non-reducible. Oh, I'm sorry, non-oxidizable. So it's a, 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 it's a not a reducing. This is a not, not, this is no longer a reducing sugar. It's not a reducing sugar. Uh, this still end though, can open and close, open and close. And so um, unless it gets another glycos, uh, glycosidic linkage, um, this part of it can still act as a reducing sugar. Amino sugars, so it does show up in here somewhere. Uh, we're, we're not going to label these as L or D or anything, but uh, amino sugars are just those that have uh, amino groups added to them. These are some important ones. N-acetyl uh, beta D-glucosamine and N-acetyl muramic acid. Muramic acid. These are we're, we're going to see make up uh, components of bacterial uh, cell walls. I think it's uh, the peptidoglycan layers. So sugars can undergo oxidation reactions, form esters. We call these glycosides or glycosidic linkages. These give us our short chains and our long chain polysaccharides. Sucrose, table sugar, um, they make some, some pretty uh, artificial sweetener um, molecules out of this. Sucralose is one of them. It's a derivative of sucrose. It's just a slightly different uh, sugar molecules in there. I was I was right. The glucose goes on top. Um, this is really bad. Sorry. Uh, glucose goes on top so that we get a alpha, beta, 1, 2. This is the 1, and this guy's the 2 because there's a, a CH2OH group down here in fructose. I don't know why I drew that so terribly. I'm sorry. Lactose, milk sugar. Uh, there's a beta galactose and a um, alpha glucose in here. Maltose and isomaltose are what we get um, through um, hydrolysis of starch. Hydrolysis meaning just going through and breaking all those uh, glycoside uh, bonds. Uh, we get a lot of little chunks of just glucoses and two glucoses together is maltose and uh, two glucoses together um, uh, that are linked via the uh, one six bond, right? For all the branching. Um, if we get those two branch points, like, you know, if we get these guys, uh, that's isomaltose. And then cellobios 
this is what we get for breaking down cellulose. And cellulose is that um, beta one for linkage. And so it's just like maltose, but it's a different linkage. So um, that's what these guys are. Oh, and then here's a bunch of pictures. So you can, you can look at these. Lactose. Maltose. Cell bios. All right, summary of everything. Polysaccharides. So we've already talked about a lot of this. So homopolysaccharide, meaning it has the same sugar throughout. Heteropolysaccharide is the word I also didn't know. Um, this one has more than one type of sugar in them. So two examples, cellulose and chitin are both, um, um, well, let's see, where are these? Chitin we find in like little organisms and plants and stuff. Um, so these just have beta linkages. Um, I think these are just examples of homo polysaccharides. Um, they're just differentiating the examples of the um, beta linkages versus alpha linkages. So starch and glycogen, alpha linkages, cellulose and chitin, beta linkages. Um, another interesting thing is that these beta linkages and cellulose and chitin are more structural. Um, and so sugar is used as like, um, you know, um, cell walls and protection, that kind of stuff. And then starch and glycogen are um, storage for nutrient. Right. If you thought that potato was storing all that starch for you, you're wrong. Uh, that's so the next potato plant has nutrients to go off uh, to, to live off. Um, so cellulose, major structural component of wood, plant fibers homopolysaccharide beta-D-glucoses. Uh, individual polysaccharide chains are hydrogen bonded together. That's how it gets so, uh, so, so strong. So here you see, uh, this, this time they got the bonds right. So beta, because it's up. Um, glucose, of course, uh, the number four carbon on glucose is always down. The OH is always down. Um, Hydrogen bonds shown here, kind of linking these cross chains or, or kind of cross linking these cellulose fibers. It's neat. So here we're just going to see some pictures of, of the molecules that we've already talked about. So here's amylose and amylopectin. So amylose shown here with alpha 1 4 linkages. Um, amylopectin with a branch. We can uh, detect um, polysaccharides with an iodine test, um, and we often rank them by how many iodine molecules or how, how much iodine is sort of detected. Um, the helical structure of these polysaccharides is perfect for trapping iodine molecules. And so when we see a blue-black color appear in the solution, it's because polysaccharides are present and trapping the iodine molecules. And then as we add a digestive enzymes or hydrolyze those or even stir in a lot of water um, and heat them up, we, we tend to see that color fade away because that means the, the ester bonds are breaking and the iodine is no longer being trapped. So it, there's a test. This is a uh, kind of explaining how the test works. Now there are some enzymes that will hydrolyze starch. I mentioned we have them in our bodies. Well, we have Amylase. And amylase is something that we have um, that, that starts in our mouth. It gets kind of uh, deactivated in our intestines because of the pH change. Um, and then in our, we have it also in our intestines and our, uh, sorry, in our stomach because of the pH change. And then in our intestines, it's secreted again to help break down any polysaccharides into small disaccharides and uh, small, well, dextrins are the smaller chunks. And then dextrins break down into disaccharides and monosaccharides for absorption. Um, into the body. Now we have beta amylase and alpha amylase. Now alpha amylase is the, the main one. This goes anywhere along those chains and um, it cuts those bonds. It's an endoglycosidase. So anywhere within the chain, it can break those bonds. The beta amylase is an exoglycosidase. This one can only go from the open side. So the last glucose that's attached, the one that doesn't have um, an ester bond, the one that's a hemiacetal, 
that one that can open and close, open and close, that's the side that this eats away the sugars from. So those are the different ways and how they work. Um, Debranching enzymes also come in and uh, remove um, these linkages. And then, of course, that just frees up the chain for alpha and beta amylase to go and work on. Glycogen is the one we have in our bodies. So we have um, a lot more branching than amylopectin. So about 13 glucose residues long per chain, uh, 12 layers of branching. We're going to see a, a picture here. There's a, a protein situated at the heart of every glycogen called gly glycogenin that helps um, store or to help, you know, kind of organize our glycogen. And we also have some other enzymes, uh, glycogen phosphorylase, um, and debranching enzymes. Now we talked about the debranching enzymes a second ago. The glycogen phosphorylase is going to help break down the glycogen. Um, um, when we are ready to use it, we want to break down our storage to free up uh, the, the free glucose. Um, I imagine there's also going to be enzymes uh, involved in storing uh, the glycogen. Uh, oh, sorry, the glucose in uh, as glycogen, creating those big long chains within our body for storage. It may or may not be the same uh, enzymes. We'll, we'll look at those in metabolism. Though we're, we're only, only really going to be looking at the breakdown and not really the, the buildup. So amylopectin in plants and glycogen in our bodies. Chitin. So another homopolysaccharide. These are, again, like cellulose, the beta-1,4 linkages. Uh, where cellulose is beta glucose, chitin is N acetyl B, uh, sorry, N acetyl beta D glucosamine. So exoskeleton and in invertebrates, insects, crustaceans, cell walls of algae, fungi, and, ye and yeast. So here is N acetyl beta D glucosamine. And again, this is the, the modification on the normal glucose molecule and then the linkages are up so beta one four and this one is um, a repeating disaccharide so what you see here uh, oh I guess it forms as a disaccharide and then um, those get linked together it's an, it's still a homo uh, what's the word a homopolysaccharide, it's too easy. All right, heteropolysaccharide, I guess I was mentally waiting for this guy. So b bacterial cell walls, I, I mentioned the peptidoglycan layer. So uh, peptidoglycan um, is what you find in the gram-positive bacteria. They have the, the big, thick layer. Uh, the gram-negatives have a smaller layer of peptidoglycan, and we're gonna look at the structure of that. Uh, it's made up of the um, two polysaccharides, N-acetyl-D-glucosamine and N-acetyl-muramic acid. So this is the N-acetyl-muramic acid. This is the N-acetyl-glucosamine. Again, uh, because there's this acetyl group on the nitrogen in this amino sugar, um, we're saying N-acetyl. And then it also has, you can see here, um, the carboxylic acid functional group, uh, or at least this one does, the muramic acid. So this is the repeating unit that we're going to see. And so um, let's see, these uh, N-acetylglucosamines are the green ones, the muramic acids are the yellow ones, and so that's the repeating chain. And then intra- or interchain, we're going to see some other cross-linking here, uh, some peptide cross-linking. So glycine residues and uh, amino acid tetrapeptides linking together. So this one links to this, which comes over and links to this, which comes over and links to this. So this is going to add to that um, bacterial cell wall. So again, peptidoglycan peptid, glycan, well, glycan from, like, glucose, I guess. I was trying to exp 
kind of explain the name peptidoglycan, but it's kind of there in the two uh, polysaccharide and, and protein portion. Pectin. This is also um, another polymer. D-galacturonic acid. Derivative of galactose, hence the name. Uh, we've got um, carboxylic acid functional group instead of the alcohol here. This one is found in plants. Another one here, lignin, found in plant walls as well. Uh, this is a polymer of not exactly a, a sugar. Um, this is a, an alcohol polymer, so a non-polysaccharide. Interesting to include it here. Some neat linkages, though. It's got a, you know, you can imagine if something, uh, if you were a plant and there was all kinds of bacteria and viruses and stuff that knew how to get through a, a, a cellulose layer or a peptidoglycan layer, you know, something made out of normal sugars, and you wanted to be, you know, uh, different and, uh, you know, harder to break into, incorporate some lignin, right? Come up with a completely different component that's non polysaccharide and see, see what can break through then. I don't know. Neat. Uh, glycosoaminoglycans. So these are polysaccharides that have repeating disaccharides where we've got amino sugars um, as at least one of the two sugars in the disaccharide, and then one of the other sugars has a negative charge uh, because of a sulfate or a carboxyl group. So we can take a look at those. I think there's a structure shown. Um, heparin is an example. This is an anticoagulant in our bodies. Um, hyaluronic acid useful for lubricating joints, component of um, the juice in your eye. Um, let's see, chondroitin, chondroitin sulfates and keratin sulfate, uh, components of connective tissue. So these are glycoaminoglycans uh, or glycosaminoglycans because they have either these groups present um, on at least one of the sugars, and then one of the sugars is an amino alcohol. So just some classifications uh, for some of these structures. So heparin we see here, those sulfates, um, those negative charges, and what else were we looking for? At least one of the sugars, oh, is an amino sugar. So that's this guy right here. So anyways, glycosoaminoglycans. So disaccharides that have important physiological um, functions in our body. So just a summary there. Storage, structural, uh, one we just looked at, physiological. Glycoproteins we haven't talked about. Uh, glycoproteins are, of course, proteins that are associated with, um, I mentioned um, uh, antibodies earlier on. Um, so these are carbohydrates associated with prep peptides. So kind of uh, like it says in the name, glycoproteins, a mixture between the two. Um, so antibodies, uh, I think what, I don't know if, if they mean antibodies. I feel like they mean antibodies, but I think they mean antigens. I don't think I spelled, I didn't spell antigens right. That's that's really, really bad. Let's try that again. How about I say it? Antigens. Oh, it's spelled right there. Antigen. Um, because what your book uses as an example is they describe an antigen, but they're calling it a, an antibody. So your antibody, um, your antibodies are, are made up of proteins for the most part. Um, it uh, recognizes foreign invaders. Um, a lot of the things that they recognize are um, these glycoproteins on the surface of, of, out, of you know, foreign, foreign bodies. So oligosaccharide portions of glycoproteins act as the antigenic determinants, so the recognizable portions, uh, which are the portions of molecules that antibodies recognize. So it's saying it right here, that these glycoproteins, right, that the sugar part of it is what an antibody recognizes. So then an antibody is, is not a glycoprotein, um, unless an antibody also ends up having some, some carbohydrates on it. But this definition right here is talking about antigens. 
Um, and so the example your body uses is that your, your blood cells, your blood cells have sugar groups on them. Um, and the different sugar groups that you have determine your, your blood type. So if you have um, beta and acetogalactosamine sticking out, you know, on top of your, your, uh, your, um, your red blood cells, and I think in this case, um, it's also having uh, beta-galactose. It's, it's like a little linkage of a couple sugars. Um, you know, these little sugar groups, be like something like that, sticking out on your red blood cells all over the place, though, right? Um, but presence of this N-acetyl uh, or beta-N-acetylgalactosamine um, is what the A group is. And then when you have... Um, uh, the B group is slightly different. Of course, this just says the exact same thing. Oh, maybe this is the difference. So they all have these groups on them. And then this sugar is what's different. And so if on this side, it's this, if on the end of all of this group sticking off off your red blood cell, you've got a, a beta and acetylglucosamine, that's an A group. And then if you've got all of this, all of this stuff, and then the galactose sticking off on the end, then that's the B group. Um, when you've got, uh, when you're AB, you've got both. When you're, um, when you're O, you don't have any. And so, you know, when you're, when you've got this on the outside of your, of your own red blood cells, you don't make antibodies for them. If you have A only, then you're type A. If you have B only, you're type B. If you have A plus B, then you're A and B. And if you don't have either A or B on your blood cells, then you're type O, I believe. Um, glycoproteins also play an important part uh, of the eukaryotic cell membranes. We saw when we were looking at the fluid um, mosaic um, that there were a lot of membrane-bound and even peripheral proteins that had big, long um, carbohydrate groups sort of sticking out. And a lot of that is for um, recognition Sometimes these are markings that get added to the outside of cells to indicate that they're, um, um, you know, they're, they're sort of slated for destruction, ready for degradation. Um, in fact, uh, that's, that's what this is kind of talking about here. Proteoglycans are, are glycoproteins that have a lot of carbohydrates in them, high carbohydrate content. Um, and since these, um, so what they are, as they get, mar they're markers for proteins that are going to get broken down continuously. Your proteins in general are constantly made and broken down. Now, um, there are certain ones that have high carbohydrate contents. These get broken down more often. Your book talks about Hurler's disease, um, where basically some amino sugar buildup leads to skeletal deformities, um, uh, a few other things, death included. Um, it's a genetic disease, I think, where, where there just is too much carbohydrate. And so um, you know, I think your cells are just overly, uh, your, your proteins are overly being broken down and you, you're not able to properly grow. Um, so glycoproteins, uh, carbohydrates in general play a lot of different roles, a lot of different, um, sort of functions throughout, you know, different organisms and even in our bodies, from signaling to, um, structure to storage, um, and, uh, messaging and, um, anticoagulation and, uh, you know, the list goes on. So um, I think that basically brings us to the to the end of the chapter here. Um, yeah, immune response, sugars and specific bonding arrangements in some proteins, um, depending on what the proteins are for. You know, like I said, communication, um, tr uh, slating for destruction, that kind of stuff. All right, guys. Well, um, hopefully you were able to, to able to follow a lot of that and uh, of course I hope you're reading your book and uh, I will be posting another video soon on uh, the beginnings of um, metabolism carbohydrate metabolism